In this section, we are talking trigonometric identities. The goal is to verify identities. So what the heck is a trigonometric identity? A trigonometric identity is an equation that is always true for input values in the domains of the functions involved in the identity. So let me, let me give you a quick example. The sine of x is equal to tangent x, cos, tangent x cosine of x as long as the input is in the domain of each function. So can you think of any input values that aren't in the domain here, on the, specifically on the right-hand side, specifically in the, in the tangent function? Where were those asymptotes for the tangent function? Well, pi, but there's a lot of them, right? Pi over 2 plus, plus k times pi, if you want to represent it, uh, uh, all of them at once, where k is an integer, right? So uh, x cannot equal these values, right? How did I get the k times pi? It, pi? Well, pi is the period of the tangent, right? We know that uh, one of the asymptotes, so one of the asymptotes occurs um, at x equals pi over 2, right? Well, that's where, it's, where the function's not defined. That pi over two is an input value that you're not allowed to plug in, right? So um, all you have to do is add the period of the tangent to that, multiple periods of the tangent of that, to get to other asymptotes, right? To get to other places, in other words, where the tangent's not defined. So what I'm trying to say is, okay, this is gonna be a true statement. Sine of x is gonna equal tangent of x times cosine of x, <coughs> except at these values. Which, are, which a lot of teachers kind of gloss over, but it's kind of important to know when, when it's not going to be true. Okay, so how would you prove something like this? Uh, so you don't, what you don't do is treat it like an equation. So, I mean, it makes sense what you said. You said divide by cosine and then you get a known identity, right? Sine x over cosine x. But we're pretending like uh, it's not necessarily all that known. I, well, let me back off that statement. It's bad form to do it that way. Um, and also because that method won't work on harder identities. So I want to I wanna show, you, show you a method wh which works on all identities for verifying identities. In general, to prove an identity, remember this, you start with one side and through either other identities or algebraic operations, you turn it into the other side, right? You don't touch the other side. You don't treat it like an equation. Even though it kind of works here, that method won't work in general, okay? It won't work every time. So you start with one side, and the way I'm gonna have, the way I'm gonna require you guys to do it is I'm gonna require that you write down the side you're starting with. And a guideline, not a rule, is to start with the side with more stuff on it, right? Um, that, that's not always true. That doesn't always work, but in this case, it's gonna work. Now, what I'd like you to do, the format I'd like you to use, just because it makes it easier on the eyes, is to work one step to the right and then work downward from there. So you're going to write down the side you're starting with on one side and then one equal sign, one step to the right and then work down. Okay? I know. Just, it, you, you may have not done it that way in other classes, but humor me. Humor me. I'm, I'm trying to make you guys present neat, well-written, well-thought-out proofs, basically. And this is, this is a nice format to follow. So um, somebody said uh, change to sines and cosines. That's often effective. What would you change here? So you would change tan x to? So there's an element of what, what you gave me there. Um, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the, those basic identities we've talked about in the past. We, you can make use of those without having to prove them. So tangent of x, I'm going to replace that with sine x over cosine x. And uh, we still have that factor of cosine x there, right? And now in the next step, what are you going to do? Or in this, kind of, you're kind of going to show it here as well. Yeah, you're going to divide, right? And then you've got it. You've turned the right-hand side, the original right-hand side, into the left-hand side, haven't you? 
So you're done. Now, uh, different teachers teach you different things to write, but you, you need to indicate that you're done. I just say done. Some, some teachers say QED, which stands for done, basically, and it's, it's a Latin phrase, but um, some, some people write a smiley face because they're happy they're finished. I don't, write, what, write down QED. Some people write down uh, a triangle group, triangular group of dots. Write one of them down to indicate you're done. I don't care which one. Not all three, you don't need to write all three. <laughs> okay, so the basic identities, I think we've already talked about these, but here they are again. Uh, the basic identities, uh, the first group of identities, I'd call them the reciprocal identities. Sine is equal to one over cosecant. Cosine x is equal to one over secant x. Tangent, one over cotangent. Don't leave off the, you, when you say it quickly, I don't mind if you say tangent is one over cotangent, but when you write it, put down the input. If it's x, put it in. Tangent x equals one over cotangent x when you write it. Uh, the middle identities, tangent x uh, equals sine x over cosine of x, that's the one we just used. And of course, you could flip that to get the cotangent of x equals cosine x over sine x. And then on the bottom, you have the Pythagorean identities, which we spent some time on, I think, last week or the week before. So the main Pythagorean identity to memorize is cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. You can derive the other ones in the way I showed you uh, when we were talking about, oh, I don't remember which section it was. One of the 5.4s, maybe. So in uh, the next several examples, we're gonna be verifying identities. Don't just pay attention to what's written down. Pay attention to how it's written down, the format, how neat it, neatly it's done. If you need to do a rough draft, do a rough draft and then make it look neat. You really wanna practice this in the homework and right now, uh, along with me, when you write it down so that you get good at these for the test, okay? So verify the identity, part A, sine x times cotangent x times secant x equals one. What do you wanna do on this one? Which side do you wanna start with? The, probably the left-hand side, right? The right-hand side is a little sparse. Doesn't have a whole lot of information in it. So let's start with the left-hand side and let's write it down. I know you guys don't like doing this, but you're gonna write it down, okay? You're gonna, and that tells me what side you're starting with. You're gonna write down the side you're starting with. And then work one step to the right and then work down. So sine x, cotangent x, secant x. Uh, what do you wanna do here? Maybe the same trick we just used? What was that? Sines and cosines. So I'll leave this factor of sine x alone. And then we know cotangent x is cosine x over sine x. What's secant x? One over cosine. So that's why you, have, you, you flat out have to memorize those basic identities in order to do these proofs in the first place. Okay, anything, does anything go away? Well, yeah, and the cosines, or the cosine x and cosine x, right? So you're just left with a factor of one, and guess what, you're done. Don't you, don't you wish that would be a, pr a problem on the test? Ah, uh, yeah. Done. <laughs> These will get progressively harder. So the, the, the technique in that one was to change the sines and cosines. Okay, there, there are other techniques. And in each one of these identities, I'm gonna introduce another technique. So uh, in part B, we have one divided by sine x plus three divided by cosine x equals cosine x plus three sine x, all in the numerator, divided by a denominator of sine x cosine x. So you could start with either side here and get it to work, but there's a particular technique I wanna show you that involves the left-hand side. So I'm gonna start with the left-hand side, so write it down, one over sine x plus three over cosine x. Work one step to the right and then down. Um, <coughs> On the left-hand side, you see, do, you, do you guys see two terms, two fractions added together? On the left-hand side, I see two fractions added together. On the right-hand side, I see a single fraction. What does that tell you to do if you start with the left-hand side? Make it, a Make it a single fraction, common denominator, yeah. yeah. 
So that's the technique I want to talk about. So what, do we, what is the common denominator between sine x and cosine x? And by the way, you can do a little bit of work in this first step if you want to show a little bit of work here. What is the common denominator between sine x and cosine x? You just take their product, right? So I'm going to multiply the first fraction by what it's missing from the LCD. The LCD is sine x times cosine x. So what is, this what is this denominator missing from the LCD? A factor of cosine of x, right? So to get it in terms, to get one over sine x in terms of the common denominator, I multiply numerator and denominator by the cosine of x. What am I really multiplying by? Just a big old one, right? Cosine x divided by cosine x equals one. Now we, we assume that cosine of x isn't gonna equal zero here, right? We don't allow those x values, but yeah. Cosine x divided by itself is equal to one. So, all right, what about this second guy here? What are we gonna multiply three divided by cosine x by? What is it missing from the LCD? A factor of sine. So we multiply by one in the form of sine x over sine x. And now if you want, you can go to a single fraction because the common denominator is gonna be sine x times cosine x. And then you remember to add fractions, you keep that common denominator and add the numerators. What do the numerators become after you do the multiplication on the left side? Cosine x yeah, one times cosine x is cosine x. And well, don't forget, the, don't forget the, the three times sine x, right? So plus three times sine x. Is that what we were after? Yeah. Done, one and done, yay. Now, you could have started with the right side and you could have undone the addition, right? Got two separate fractions and then simplified and you would end up with the left side. That would work even better probably. But I wanted to show you that technique of combining, right? Getting, getting two separate fractions added together into one because that's going to come up. So what, what technique is that? It's just algebra, isn't it? It's just algebra. So um, we don't always use identities with other identities within proving a given identity, we, we often just use algebraic techniques. Okay, or a combination of the two. So in part C, we have sine squared x minus two sine x plus one divided by the quantity sine x minus one, and the claim is that that is equal to sine of x minus one. All right, which side do you wanna start with? The hard side? The, well, the stuff with more stuff on it, yeah. The side with more stuff on it, that is. So I'm gonna write down the side with more stuff, the left side. And I, I really wanna just try and simplify it somehow to make it look like sine x minus one. Well, let's see, I, I can't think of any identities to use, but are there any algebraic techniques that might work here? So, it, I mean, ultimately, it looks like we want to get rid of this denominator somehow and just end up with sine x minus one. That's, it looks like that's where we're going, right? But the only way I know of to get rid of denominators is to divide, to cancel things out, right? So, how might we do that? That's the universal symbol for two parentheses, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, we're going we're gonna to factor the numerator. Remember that technique? We treat it like a a polynomial and we factor it like reverse with the reverse foil method. Remember that? So um, let's do that. So that's, that's a good suggestion. Uh, we need to make the parentheses a little longer than normal. Denominator stays exactly the same. And then here's, here's what's going on in your mind, you guys. You don't necessarily have to Write this down. In fact, I don't want you writing it down within the identity, but as scratch work, if you want to think of, of sine of x as a, a, a single variable like u, then really that numerator becomes uh, u squared minus 2u plus 1, right? And if it helps you to think of it that way, don't, don't write it down within the proof of the identity, but you could write it down off to the side if it helps you to think of, that way, uh, think of, uh, think of it that way because maybe it'll be easier for you to factor. So wh how, how do you factor u squared minus 2u minus 1? Remember, reverse FOIL, when there's a 1 in front of the u squared, 
foil method first outer inner last oh the first guys that multiply together here and here have to both be u to get a u squared right and then when it's a one in front of the thing being squared, you just look for two numbers whose product is one and whose sum is negative two. They have to multiply together to be positive one and, and add together to be negative two. Got to be what? Minus one both times, right? So u minus one times u minus one or u minus one squared. Okay, but I, I'm not going to... I'm not going to show that work within the identity. I'm just going to go ahead and, and factor, not, not make the replacement of u, not replace sine of x with u, and just factor it as sine of x minus 1 times sine of x minus 1. Or if you prefer sine of x minus 1 quantity squared, that would work fine as well. And then what happens? Good things? Bad things? Good things, right? Sine x divided by sine x makes 1. Now, it's got to be a product in the numerator to apply this sort of cancellation, right? You can't cancel between plus or minus signs. You have to, you have to cancel whole quantities. And then we're just left with uh, that, that original right-hand side, right? So sine x minus 1, and we're done. That wasn't so bad, right? Digging ditches is worse, right? Let's face it, have you ever dug a ditch? It's not fun, no fun. This is better, this is more fun. So in part D we have secant squared x plus two tangent x is equal to the, the quantity tangent x plus one squared. By the way, so what was the technique in that last problem? Factoring, Factoring. That, it's an, another algebraic technique to get from one side to the other, okay. So in this one we have secant squared x plus two tangent x equals the quantity tangent x plus one squared. Okay, uh, which side do you want to start with? Is this one as clear which side to start with? I think it's the right side, but I don't think it's as, as clear cut, is it? I, will, I would pick the right side. Why did you pick the right side? I know why I picked it. Uh, what, what, uh, factors, and you mean expand, you mean multiply it out. The opposite of factoring, right? Yeah, so that, that exponent of 2 on the outside of that quantity gives us something to do on the right side. So that's why I picked it. We can multiply out the right side. Instead of factoring, we do the opposite. We multiply it out. So that's why I picked the right-hand side. Now, little reminder here. This is not part of the identity. Um, you, you could write down tangent x plus 1 twice and FOIL it out, right? But there's a better way. You can remember the formula a plus b quantity squared is equal, okay, a, a is the first guy, b is the, the second guy or last guy, right? So that formula says what? To, to multiply it out, you, you take the first guy and square it, and then you add in what? Yeah, you add in uh, a plus b doubled, or a times b doubled, rather. So you take the product of the two guys, double them and add it in, and then you add in the, the second guy squared. Right? And it works just as well if you have a minus here, you just replace that plus with a minus. So that formula, it, you end up squaring these, that's called a binomial. You end up squaring binomial like quantities so much it's worth memorizing. It really is. So what's acting like A here? Tangent. What's acting like B? So tangent's first guy, B, uh, one is the second guy. Let's, let's use the formula. What does the formula tell us? We square the first guy, so tangent squared. The way we write that is tangent and then the two between the n and the x, but it really does mean tangent of x, the whole thing squared. Uh, plus what? Yeah, tangent x times one doubled, right? That's what this part says. And I didn't put the times one, I didn't bother putting the times one. Plus what? One squared is just one. Now, so we're trying to we're trying to get that to look like secant that so we're trying to get this to look like this, right? Secant squared x plus two tangent x. We're not quite there yet. It's not one and done in this one, right? Do you do you see part of an identity hiding in this anywhere? Do you see so you see uh, tangent squared x plus one is one of our Pythagorean identities, right? Now what here's what I don't want you to do. 
I don't want you to just go to the answer. You may recognize that tangent squared x plus 1 is secant squared, right? But if you, if you just go to it, you're going to get points off. Because there's a trick that, that clever students have learned, even not so clever students, that if you don't know what to do in identity, you know what you're shooting for, right? Just write down a couple of steps and then put down that left-hand side. And you, a miracle occurs, and there it is. And I can't tell if you know what you're doing if you go right to writing down secant squared x plus 2 tangent x, or you didn't know what to do and you just decided to write that down, right? I, so you've got to show this, this, this seemingly innocuous, purposeless step of grouping the tangent squared x plus, uh, and the plus 1 together, okay? You've got to show this step. And even put parentheses around it to emphasize you're, you're grouping those two guys together. So those of you that, didn't, that don't have this identity memorized, it's this one up here. It's uh, this one we're, making you, we're, we're about to make use of, right? So I'm grouping the tangent squared x and the plus 1 together so that I can replace it with secant squared x. And so that's why you've got to memorize these identities or, or at least be familiar with this one so you know to use it, right? The, the second two you can derive if you know the first Pythagorean identity, but you've got to at least be familiar with it. I recommend just memorizing it. It's easier. So now, now that I've shown this step, I can go ahead and replace tangent squared x plus 1 with secant squared x, and no explanation needed just except for the grouping of the terms together. So secant squared x, and then we, we have the, the plus 2 tangent x, so we're done. We turn the right-hand side into the left-hand side, the original right-hand side, that is. So done. Okay? So the trick here was two tricks, right? We multiplied out. Instead of factoring like we did in the last one, we, we multiplied out a binomial-like quantity. It's not a binomial, technically, but it's a binomial-like quantity because you have two things added together in those parentheses, tangent x and the plus one. Um, and then we expanded that. We multiplied that out. That was one trick. That was one algebraic trick. And then we made use of that Pythagorean identity, tangent squared x plus 1 equals secant squared x. That was another trick. So two tricks in one problem. Okay, part E we have, that's a sine x divided by 1 plus cosine x equals cosecant x minus cotangent x. Now, you could start with either side and get it. You could start with, like, the right-hand side and change to sines and cosines and probably get it to work. But there's a particular trick I want to show you in this one that involves the left-hand side. So that's the side we're going to start with. So write down the side you're starting with. And then you're going to work one step to the right and then down. So there, there's another trick for getting rid of certain kinds of denominators. Notice on the left-hand side, I have a fraction. On the right-hand side, I don't. I have two terms that could be written as fractions, but, but they're two separate terms separated by a minus. I have a single term on the left side, two separate terms on the right side. It would be hard to write the left-hand side as two separate terms with that denominator there. So there's a trick for getting rid of denominators, um, and, and this trick works well for denominators like 1 plus cosine x, 1 plus or minus cosine x, 1 plus or minus sine x. This trick works very well for. Um, so what we're going to do, and I'll, I'll start, start it right here, we're going to multiply numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. You remember what a conjugate is? What's the conjugate of a plus b? a minus b. And what's the conjugate of a minus b? a plus b. So we're going to multiply numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the denominator. What's the conjugate of the, the denominator 1 plus cosine x? 1 minus cosine x. 1 minus cosine x. And that, because of a certain trig identity, that's going to get rid of the plus in the denominator. Um, it won't be a sum or difference anymore in the denominator once we're done. Okay, so that's, that's my... That's writing down my, the side I'm starting with and actually performing a step there. One step to the right, then down. So on top, I'm just going to leave it as sine x. I'm, I'm going to leave the product, uh, multiply straight across. I'm going to leave it as sine x times 1 minus cosine x for now. And in the bottom, I'm, I'm actually going to multiply out the bottom. 
So remember, there's an applied set of parentheses around the denominator, the division bar is a grouping symbol. If you actually multiply out conjugates, a plus b times a minus b, what is a plus b times a minus b? It's a squared minus b squared, right? The inner and outer terms from the FOIL method, they cancel out. So that's, that's w one reason why we like the conjugate. When you take a plus b times a minus b, okay, FOIL method, a squared would be the first, the outer would be what? a times b, so minus a times b. The inner, plus b a or plus a b. And the last, b squared. What happens with the outer and inner multiplications? When you add them together, they cancel out. You get a squared minus b squared. That's where that famous <laughs> factoring formula comes from, right? Going the other way, a squared minus b squared is equal to a plus b times a minus b. So this is the only time in the FOIL method you don't have to worry about the outer and inner terms, right? when you multiply. So with that in mind, do the multiplication and just multiply the first terms together. What's one times one? So just do the first and last multiplications. Uh, what do we get for the last multiplication? Including the operation? Minus cosine squared x. Oh, but what's one minus cosine squared x? Pythagorean, the first Pythagorean identity tells us it is sine squared. So if you solve this first Pythagorean identity for sine squared, in other words, subtract cosine squared from both sides, another identity you can make use of based on that first Pythagorean identity is the fact that sine squared is equal to one minus cosine squared. And so that's the, that's the purpose of that whole trick of multiplying by, by the conjugate. So this denominator, in the next step, working downward, this denominator, one minus cosine squared x, I'm gonna replace it with sine squared x to make a long story short. Numerator stays the same, denominator becomes sine squared x. Okay, so what's gonna happen now? What are you allowed to do now? That, that the numerator is factored completely? and the denominator has, has a single quantity being squared, you can divide, which is what we usually call canceling, yeah. Right? Sine x divided by sine squared x is the same as one over sine x. Oh, so that means we have one minus cosine x divided by sine x, and you might think, oh, that, we didn't get anywhere. That doesn't look like the right-hand side of the original statement of the identity, does it? Any ideas on what we could do? Undo the, the subtraction, right? So if we just take, if we break up this fraction, one, okay, this guy becomes one numerator, one divided by sine x minus cosine x over sine x. So we're, we're keeping, we're undoing the addition, but, but we still have to keep that common denominator when we undo the addition, right? You're not used to going in that direction, but, but it should work. And then I think we have it. What's one over sine x? Using the reciprocal identity, cosecant, cosine x over sine x, cotangent x, don't forget the input of x. Is that what we were after? Cosecant x minus, co oh yeah, look at that. Done. Yes. Oh, are you talking about like right here? Yeah. yeah, I see that those kind of mistakes all the time. You can't cancel within a quantity, right? You can't cancel between a minus or a plus sign. Uh, the easiest way to, to see that would be to just use numbers. If you took two plus three and divided by two, are you allowed to cancel the twos? No, I don't even know what that would be, but if, if you tried it, you might think there's a one there and then one plus three is four. It's not right. What is the answer there? You can't cancel those twos. The answer is just, oh, you, you, the, the division bar is a grouping symbol. You add the two and the three first and you get five halves, right? Whereas if it were multiplication right here, two times three over two, um, if you didn't cancel, you'd get six over two, which is three. If you did cancel, you'd get three. So it's just an example. You can pick numbers like this and remind yourself of how the operations should work, how the 
division or canceling should work. Okay, any questions on that one? So what was the main trick in that one? Multiplying numerator and denominator by the conjugate because we saw the denominator was of the form one plus cosine x. If it were one plus sine x or one minus cosine x or one minus sine x, I would still use the conjugate trick there uh, because you're gonna get to make use of the Pythagorean identity if you do that. Still, that one was still easier than digging ditches, but it was harder, right? Much like this one. Part F, uh, we have two sine x cotangent x, that's all one term, because it's a product, plus sine x, that's another term by itself, minus four cotangent x, that's another term, minus two. How many terms are there all together in that numerator? F four, there's four individual products or single terms, right? And then that whole thing, that whole numerator is divided by two cotangent x plus one, and the claim is that that's equal to sine x minus two. So the trick I'm gonna show you on this one is a repeat. It's a, it's, a, it's a trick you've seen before. It's gonna involve factoring the numerator. It's just this type of factoring you, you need a little bit of review on. So the numerator, you see four terms. Do you remember what method of factoring you often used when you, see, when you saw four terms back in algebra? You group it? Yeah, it's factoring by grouping, very good. So um, you group two terms together at a time and you look uh, to see if there's a GCF you can factor out. Uh, let's start there and then I'll continue on. So let's write down the, the side we're starting with. Uh, I think the side with more stuff on it's the left-hand side. Two sine x cotangent x plus sine x minus four cotangent x minus two. It's hard to make straight division bars when their numerators are this long. That's the side we're starting with. Work one step to the right. Okay, so I'm gonna group the first two terms together. Is there a, a, a common factor in those first two terms? Two sine x cotangent x plus sine x. So that's what I'm gonna factor out. I'm gonna factor out sine of x, that common factor. So I'm gonna factor out sine of x and then what's from just the first two terms in the numerator and then what's left? Two, don't forget the two, times the cotangent. What's left from this sine x term? Just a one, a plus one, right? But you can't forget that. Plus one, close the parenthesis. And then, um, is everybody with me so far? Now, in the technique of factor by grouping, when you group the second set of terms together, you wanna get, once you factor out the appropriate uh, GCF you, or, or, or common factor, may not be the greatest common factor in all cases, it usually is. Um, you wanna get the same thing in parentheses that you have in the other grouping. So we want two cotangent x plus one in, in parentheses. Is there a way I can get that? So we have minus four cotangent x minus two. What do I need to factor out to get two cotangent x plus one in parentheses? Uh, a minus two, you gotta include the operation, minus two. And then what's, what's left, let's make sure, what's left when I factor out a minus two from minus co four cotangent x? It'll be a, a positive two cotangent x. And what's left when we factor out a minus two from minus two? plus one. Everybody see that? The denominator is not going anywhere. Now if you got tricky here, you could figure out a way to cancel and, and not be wrong. Because division distributes just like multiplication does, you could distribute the canceling. If you do that, I'm gonna mark you off, even if you get it right. Because uh, I want you to do this the correct way because if you don't, it'll lead to mistakes later on. So you, the, the numerator's not factored all the way. I want you to factor it completely. So how do I know it's not factored all the way? Factoring means product, right? You write it as a product. When you factor 12 as three times four, you're writing 12 as a product of other numbers. When you factor a, a polynomial, or in this case, uh, a numerator involving trig functions, it's gotta be a product of, of other trig functions or other quantities. 
So um, I know this isn't factored all the way because the minus between these two quantities we've created. But the good news is what? If there is good news. We've got the same factor in both of those terms we've created in the numerator, right? Both of those products. So we can factor out two cotangent x plus one from both of those terms. So that's how you really want to think of it. You can factor it out on the left or on the right. It doesn't matter. We'll do it on the left. We'll factor that out over there. And then let's write down what we factored out. So we'll write that down in purple. So we factored out two cotangent x plus one. We pulled both of these quantities out, put in parentheses, and then what's left? The sine of x, what else? Minus two. And then we still have two cotangent x plus one in the denominator. So now that everything is factored in the numerator and you only have one term in the denominator, you can factor, or you can divide out like quantities. Do you see like quantities? Yeah. Notice I'm not factoring individually the two times cotangent x. I'm dividing out, I meant to say, I'm dividing out the entire quantity two cotangent x plus one with this two cotangent x plus one. The entire quantity gets divided out. What are you left with? Isn't that what we were after? Yep, sine of x. And remember, it's minus two on the outside. It's not the sine of x minus two in parentheses. It's the sine of x. X is the input. Then from sine of x, you're subtracting two. The parentheses around the x are implied if you don't write them down. If you did mean to say sine of x minus two, that the input is x minus two into the sine, you'd, you'd have to do it that way. You'd have to have the parentheses there. Here, the parentheses are optional. That's it, right? That's the right-hand side. So we're done. You could put a check mark, I suppose, to say you're done. Something. Uh, maybe if you didn't like that problem, you could put a sad face. I don't know. Something to indicate you're done. Still easier than digging ditches, I tell you. So, so what was the, the big trick in that one? Factoring. factoring specifically, factoring by grouping. It will come up. Okay, uh, so finally, part G, uh, one plus tangent cubed x divided by one plus tangent x equals one minus tangent x plus tangent squared x. Okay, so anybody want to guess on the, the algebra trick I want to show you in this one? Okay, I'm going to write something down. A cubed plus B cubed. Anybody remember a formula for factoring A cubed plus B cubed? Something, right? A plus AB minus <laughs> You're right on the first one. You're right on the first factor. It's a, in the second factor, it's A squared. If it's a plus here, it's got to be a minus here. And it's AB, not 2AB like the other formula, but just AB, minus AB, and then plus B squared. That's, that's called uh, the sum of two cubes factoring formula. And uh, by the way, if it's a minus here, then it's a minus here and a plus here. So mm -hmm. some difference of two cubes, they look the same, except you switch uh, the plus and the minus around. Okay? So now, back to part G, do you see a sum of two cubes anywhere? Is there a way to rewrite one, that numerator on the left side, one plus tangent cubed x to make it the sum of two cubes? One cubed is one, right? So what's acting like A, what's acting like B? A is one, B is tangent x. Okay, so that's my scratch work. I'm gonna start the problem now. So I'm gonna write down the side I'm starting with, which is one plus tangent cubed x divided by one plus tangent x. Okay, one step to the right, and then I work downwards. So in the one step to the right, I want to factor one plus tangent cubed x. Okay, so let's look at the formula. A plus B, A is one, B is tangent x. What, what's that first factor going to look like? One plus tangent x. Okay, so first factor, A plus B is one plus tangent x. And then the second factor, okay, A squared is what squared? One squared. Oh, so that's just one, isn't it? Minus AB, what's that going to be? 
minus tangent x plus, yeah, b squared is tangent squared x. And then, remember, we still have this denominator here, but not for long, yeah. And so this one turned out to be a pretty short problem. I just wanted to illustrate or remind you of that formula that you tend to forget for factoring a cubed plus b cubed. So we divide it out. And what's left is the right-hand side we were shooting for. So 1 minus tangent x plus tangent squared x. Done. So let's, let's do a little summary of, of what we talked about. So uh, these are guidelines. They're not written in stone. You're not going to use each one in each, uh, in each identity you prove, but it, it gives you something to kind of grab a hold of. So identity, identity verification guidelines. Number one, work with the side with more stuff. You don't always do that. But, you know, if you don't have any, any idea what else to do, try to work with the side with more operations going on and more functions in it. Uh, number one, no, that was number one. Number two, perform operations like addition, subtraction, that x is for multiplication, but we don't usually use an x for multiplication at this level, right? Don't, don't do that. Squaring, or uh, you could factor. Um, you can use established identities. You probably do that more often than not. Change the sines and cosines, that's number four. Multiply by a special form of one. For example, multiply numerator and denominator by a conjugate. Number six, look at the other side of the equal sign to see if you're headed in the right direction, right? So, I mean, you're not, you're not allowed to play with the identity like it's an equation, but you can look at the other side as sc for scratch work and see if, if where you're going uh, looks like it's headed in the right direction by, by looking at the other side uh, just in your scratch work. Uh, and I'll show you more examples of that later on. And then I, I make, you know, I, I make, I, I, this should be called warning. Uh, the warning, these guidelines uh, can be helpful, but they're not written in stone. Be flexible. Sometimes you work with the side with less stuff on it. 